Welcome, everyone, to the Marketing with a Book podcast. Thank you for joining us today. A very special guest, somebody who I've admired for 30 years, and so glad she's spending some time with us today. But first, we like to do our author roll call to see who's on our call from Indie Books International, some of our authors. So please tell us where you're from, give us your name, and give us the title of your book. And we'll start with Craig and then go to David. Good afternoon. I'm Craig Glotter. I'm calling from beautiful Chicago, and I'm the author of Smooth Selling Forever. Thanks, Craig. Uh, David. Thanks, Henry. Hi, I'm David Goldman, and I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Ain't so beautiful today. And I am the author of The Road to Happiness, How to Get What You Really Want. Thanks. How about Diane and then Joe? Hello, my name is Diane Ployce. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. The working title of my book is Questions You Need to Ask Before You Buy That Franchise. Thanks for being with us, Diane. And let's go with uh, Mark and then, I'm sorry, Joe and then Mark. Thanks, Henry. I'm Joe Palo. I'm author of How to Sell Nothing and I'm in Shoreview, Minnesota. Uh, Mark, and then Dr. Pam. Thank you, Henry. My name is Mark LeBlanc, and I'm in Minneapolis. I happen to serve as the chairman of Indie Books International. Excited to share with you that in the next three weeks, we will be introducing uh, a new book titled Rainmaker Confidential, co-authored with uh, Scott Love and our own Henry. Uh, so very excited about that. Thanks, Mark. And uh, did I, oh, Dr. Pam. Hello, everyone. I am Pam Straker. I am the author of Let Me Stop You Right There. And I am authoring a book now uh, that is centering on caregiving and humor. Thanks, Dr. Pam. And I'm Henry DeVries. I'm the author of Marketing with a Book. I run Indie Books International. Uh, I'm just the quarterback. There's a team of 30 people here. We work with independent consultants who want to attract high paying clients by marketing with a book and a speech. On a speaking note, I'm a professional speaker who speaks on Persuade with a Story. In fact, in the last 10 years, I have been the ghostwriter, co-author, editor of more than 300 business books, including my international bestseller, How to Close a Deal Like Warren Buffett, now in Chinese. As a result of working with me, independent consultants report that they get more credibility, more impact, more influence, and more clients. On a personal note, I am a baseball nut. I have visited 46 Major League Baseball parks. And I got offered to speak in uh, 2023. So I checked out the baseball schedule, made sure they, the team was uh, gonna be at spring training and accepted a, a speaking engagement in Phoenix, Arizona. So that's how I run. Thanks for being with us today. We're all about speakers and authors helping speakers and authors. And we have our Indie Books Forum coming up. That's gonna be March, uh, March 4th and 5th. Uh, one of our featured speakers, in fact, a legend in the industry we're gonna honor is uh, Susan Rowan. And Susan is with us today. Let me give you her bio and then Susan and I are gonna have a conversation. Um, Susan is a person I heard speak 30 years ago at a National Speakers Association meeting in San Diego. I was just so impressed with her and her story and have just followed her for years, have shared some of her wisdom through my Forbes.com column, always been impressed. Um, Susan says you can't 
leverage the contacts you don't have. So you have to be able to meet people, mingle, connect, and engage. Uh, in essence, work a room. And that was her bestseller, How to Work a Room, uh, that I heard her speak about. And she's had many wonderful books since then. Uh, she's always been inventing and changing. But it's always been about building a network and relationships. It's a safety net for support. That message is so important today for speakers and authors. Um, if you've ever walked into a meeting room of strangers or colleagues, uh, or now it's entered a Zoom room for a business or social event and you felt uncomfortable, you'll be happy to know, says Susan, you're not alone. Uh, that's why her first book, the classic bestseller, How to Work a Room, has sold over 1 million copies in 14 countries. In fact, between the two of us, Susan and I have sold over 1 million books. Uh, she is phenomenally successful. Uh, she was named by Forbes.com as one of the networking experts to follow. She's an author. She's an in-demand international keynote speaker. She's shared her message of connection and communication with audiences worldwide. And she's been quoted in diverse publications, including the New York Times, CNN, Financial Times, USA Today, Forbes.com, Men's Health, BuzzFeed, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Huffington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Plus, she's been on many television and radio shows and podcasts worldwide. She is somebody to learn from. Um, her client list is stellar. Um, how would you like to have this as your client list? Uh, Coca-Cola, Kraft Foods, the U.S. Air Force, uh, Yale University, Apple Computer. So she's really made a mark uh, in doing this. The, uh, she trademarked the phrase, the mingling maven. So we're going to hear now from the mingling maven. Please welcome Susan Rowan. Yay. So Susan, you're on mute. There um, you go. Um, and it says on mute. I unmuted and there I am. Uh, I, I was laughing when you talked about that. 30 years ago in San Diego, I seem to remember that I said something like to a group of speakers who were going to write books, I said, believe me, I've been through it. The writing, though it's difficult, is the easy part. Everything afterward is torture. Then I get into the elevator and this guy says to me, Susan, you were the most depressing person in this entire <laughs> conference. And I said, how could that be? I'm utterly charming. He said, no, you said that writing is the easy part and it's difficult. And I said to him, you know, after hearing what you said, I respectfully agree with myself because the writing is difficult, but afterwards is the incredible work that you can't do alone. You have to do with other people. And I, to this day, I still think that that is a lot of work and I've not changed my opinion. Certainly, it was not easy work for you to get that book published. I recall you telling the story of how many publishers you had to talk to and um, could you share the possible title of How to Work a Room Like a Mensch? Well, you know, it's so interesting. I. I would like to have done that. In fact, I, I like to put a, that kind of twist on things. And by the way, How to Work a Room is the first business book that ever had a Yiddish glossary. Sh schlep, nash, nudge. That may not be Yiddish, but you get my drift, mensch. Um, what's interesting is my original publisher who I was his second, pardon the pun, crossover books because he did mostly Judaica. Um, he was a little testy about the Yiddish glossary. When they sold it as a trade to Warner, my Irish Catholic editor said, could you expand the Yiddish glossary for us? <laughs> and so I have, and I tell people that I brought the word schmooze into the lexicon and Malcolm Gladwell may have said Maven, but I used that years ago. Um, but, you know, I've done four, three full updates of the book over the last 33 years. 
four of my first six bosses in marketing and PR and advertising uh, were Jewish. And I asked one, I said, is it a coincidence that I keep being hired by Jewish people? And he said, well, for one, we know about suffering. And two, <laughs> who else would have you? Yeah. So uh, you didn't have to explain nudge uh, to me no, and uh, a shlemiel and, and these words um, sometimes. Did you know um, General Colin Powell spoke yes, fluent did. Yiddish? Yes, yeah. I did. I knew that um, years ago. And then there was also an article when he met with uh, Shamir that he said to Shamir in Yiddish, I speak Yiddish. And so that was probably pretty cool for all the foreign people going, oh, we've got nobody else here that can translate that. So it was like speaking pig Latin, but with a twist. Now, did. Susan and I would have conversations um, on Friday afternoons during this last year and a half. Uh, we called it our quarantini call. Yeah. Uh, so like a martini shot at the end of a movie. So we would uh, debrief. And I was always so impressed with your uh, energy and your enthusiasm and uh, just the positive spirit that you bring. Um, you, you've done so much, but you're not willing to hang it up now. You've got a message to get out there. What's yeah. the why that's driving you, Susan? Well, you know, I was lucky enough to have my life purpose chart done in Hawaii by a very, I guess, the beginning of the woo-woo people. I've actually tried to find this guy. And of course, he's in my course that I give in Hawaii. He mm -hmm. offers to do my life purpose chart. He asks me about this, uh, the next life. And I just looked at him and said, we don't believe in the next life. We have to behave in this one. And he tried to get me to imagine it. And of course, he was from Chicago and lived in the neighborhood, which I did not know at the time. But having my life purpose chart done years ago, clarity, I'm a former school teacher. So that what is my job now, what I wanted to do is to bring that world of not just civility, but the ability to connect, to speak to people, the confidence. I wanted to bring that to the world. And that knowing that that's my job, even though someone once asked me, oh my God, you're such a good speaker. Why don't you sell prepaid legal insurance? Really? I mean, uh, yeah, I didn't, I, I, I can't play poker because the face gives away all the thoughts. Um, I learned it from my students in Chicago, how to roll my eyes in the back of my head. Uh, but it's staying on that task, Henry, and it's knowing that my, this is my job is to make people comfortable in any situation and to give them the tools. And I would say this, and I think How to Work a Room does it, give people permission to talk to people they don't know. I used to say, I only pretend to like people, um, and, but you still have to go out there and talk to them. But really, I have found that through your teaching, everybody's uncomfortable in that room. Um, just being generous spirit, a generous spirit to other people there makes it go so much better. What, what, what's some other advice you like to share with people? Well, you know what? It's, I have just had my, I call it my condo facelift. I've had my condo totally facelifted. And after I've paid all the bills, I've said, well, I'm stuck with this one because it all went into the carpeting. Mm -hmm. But what I noticed when I watched the guys get ready to lay the carpeting, it's preparation. You know, the army old saw the five P's, prior planning prevents, and I'll leave off the other P, but per performance. Yeah. Um, but I also think prior planning promotes positive success. So it's really the planning, the preparation. I mean, if you're going somewhere, did you look and see who's in the group? Did you look at the website? Did you check people on LinkedIn, et cetera? And even something as simple, Henry, as you know you're going to go somewhere, you know you're going to have to make conversation. Read the paper, all the conversation you ever want to make. See, Henry's easy because all I had to say is, yeah, I watched every 
game of the playoffs between the Dodgers and the Giants. And we could have talked for hours, especially about that lousy third call, Mm -hmm. uh, that call in the last game that we think is very suspicious. I, being from Chicago, thinks some umpire got a little palm crossed with silver. And And do you see what I just did? What I did is throw back to Henry, to the baseball, to the games I know we both watched because I knew he was a baseball fan. So I know some people are going to be on this call saying, well, I I don't do small talk. I'm really important. I want to do a deep dive. Here's what I say to people when they say that. Really? Do you see a lake or a pool around here? You have to earn the right to ask the questions and to have the more in-depth conversation. Just because you have a drink in one hand and you got an hors d'oeuvre in the other and you showed up on the same Zoom or in the same room, you haven't earned the right. You have to do that through conversation, which starts with small talk, and that might be baseball. Small talk is huge. Another great strategy I thought you get you get you should get more credit for is the idea of you don't you're not in this alone you can go in with a buddy and you've partnered i know with patricia fripp uh, author past president of the national speakers association uh, certainly a part of the indie books family and why don't you talk about how the two of you would go to events you'd be prepared but you would help each other and this is the tip Some people would be shy of saying all the wonderful things about themselves. But if you have a friend who not only by their words, but by their tone, by their visual presence is excited and enthusiastic and can introduce you, then you're not saying all those things about yourself. So that's how we do this. In fact, Oh, have you met Susan Rowan? This is Patricia. Have you met Susan Rowan, famous best-selling author? And I said, and have you met Patricia Fripp, one of the best speakers in the country and the first woman president of National Speakers Association? And now I would add, and the finest executive speech coach. And one time, one woman at an event in San Francisco, and I said, after I was introduced to her, I said, oh, it's so nice to meet you. This is something we must never do. She looked at me and said, really, we've already met. Luckily, I didn't go Chicago on her because there were other people around. And I'm thinking, you dumbbell. Now, here's what she's lucky about. I don't remember her name because now I use it in Twitter and all over the (laughs) internet. But I thought to myself, she actually gave me a gift because now I have included in books in my talks, don't ever do that. Because right now we're meeting so many people and we have so much on our mind. And if I did meet you, you're gonna call me on it in front of other people? That's not a good move. Because I might have the client to recommend to you that you want or the job you want or the editor you might want for your whatever. Don't do that to people. It reminds me of Aunt Tilly, who went away to visit the family in Canada. And she came back and my grandfather, he was about 86 at the time, was beginning to lose his memory a little. He took care of her because she said to him when she came back, Pa, do you remember my name? And my grandfather looked at her and said, what's the matter, Tilly? You forgot. So really, let's not ever ask people if they remember us. That puts them on the spot. And what we want to do is make people comfortable with us. Our job in any room is to make other people comfortable with us because when they're at ease, they will be more open, will be more open, conversation flows and relationships build. Susan, I was at an event once, it was very dressy and I was the president of the ad and PR agency. And I introduced myself to a woman and she said, why, Henry, Henry DeVries, you don't recognize me with my clothes on. <laughs> and I was so grateful my wife wasn't there. As it turned out, she was a student of mine who came to my class, my graduate class, right from the gym. 
no makeup, you know, hair wet, in sweats. And here she was in an evening gown and looking like a million dollars. So it, it happens. Something great I learned from you, and uh, maybe you can elaborate on this too, is sometimes you don't get the buddy. And to make yourself a hero, you do what you and Fripp did for each other. But I would meet somebody, ask them a few questions and uh, say, oh, well, I meet a lot of people. Who are you looking for to meet at this event? And they said, well, you know, I'm looking to meet construction presidents. And I said, okay. And then as I'm networking, I meet a construction president and I say, oh, come with me. There's someone I want you to meet. And I bring them over. And then I would introduce this person with everything they had told me. I said, I think you two should talk. Well, you're the biggest hero because they don't really like people either. And they don't really like putting themselves out in front of them. And uh, with a little memory and a few nice questions, you can go a far way. Um, do, you, do you have a comment on that? Oh, do I ever. And you know me, so you know I would. I was once doing a radio interview at our big um, 50,000 watt station and uh, somebody called in and said something. And I'm going to say this, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Anyone who likes people, working a room is just an extension of liking people. For people who don't like people, and this is what I said on the radio show, to which the host said, well, that was reverse sales psychology. I said, if you don't like people, please don't buy my book. Because if you use any of the strategies or suggestions or advice, you will come off looking disingenuous. So if you like people, this will all work for you. You'll try something, you'll try something else. If you don't like people, we'll, we'll figure it out and we'll know it. So I'm going to go from the premise that the people who are most comfortable in the room are the people who like people, people who also like themselves and are willing to laugh, not just with people, but at themselves. And here's another Rowan uh, reminder. Humor is so intensely important. It's a way of connecting people. But when I first wrote How to Work Room, I went to the humor library in San Francisco. By the way, if you ever can't sleep, pick up a couple of books on humor research. You will be out like a light. But um, what I learned, and it's something that I believe, humor is never at the expense of someone else. When you're in a room and you're jabbing people and thinking it's fun, other people are uncomfortable. So humor is important. It's how we build bonds. It's never the expense of other people. And one of my friends from eighth grade said this, and I thought it was brilliant, and I still do. She said to me, I must have made fun of someone. And she said, you know, Susan, you must never make fun of anyone about something they can't change in a minute. I can never not be short. I'm 4'11". Don't make short jokes. So I thought that was pretty... She was in eighth grade. That meant she was about 14. That was pretty smart. So really working a room, it seems like it's work because we're standing on our feet and it's exhausting, but it's really making nice in a room. And it's same things on Zoom. Whatever you think you want to say that's your, my honest opinion, if it's a negative one, don't say it. Keep it to yourself. So what are some questions that you might suggest people can ask? Oh, this is easy. And if anyone is, you might want to jot this down as a note. Um, there are some questions to ask, but whoever said, and I think it was Dale Carnegie, oh, just ask people a lot of questions and they'll get to talk about themselves, their favorite subject. Susan Rowan is saying, don't do that. Because what A, you do is put people on a spot if you're just asking them a lot of questions. B, I learned this from a Harvard professor who was quoted, I think, in Fortune. You turn the floor over to someone else, which means you're not participating. And C, conversation is not just asking questions. And this is the Rowan conversation. It's a trifecta. 
It's you bring your or so you can paddle through the pauses. O, observe. A, ask questions. R, reveal. If you use all three, you're really having a dynamic conversation. If you just ask questions, you're nosy. But you can ask questions. And here's another tip. Instead of thinking, what am I going to say next? The title of my third book. How about listen to the answers? Because people tell you what they want to talk about. So the questions are you, you're, let's say you're in a room and we're all getting back to events. Well, I'm in Northern California. We just went through the cyclone bomb. And let me tell you, oh my goodness, we're, we're, we're still dealing with it. So weather is something. Weather is something to talk about. It happens to everyone. Traffic. How long did it take you to get here? And how about this one? Did you find a parking spot? Here's how you know there's a God. You find a parking spot in front of the place you're going to. Oh, it was meant to be. Really, it sounds like my grandmother. Oh, there's a God. Um, so really, if you ask questions, that's fine. But talk about the things you have in common. Why are you in that room? What's the purpose? What's the meeting? Who's the organization? Have you been to that room before? Did you look at the sweet table? Look at all those great desserts. By the way, a special tip for people. If you're in a room and they have a buffet table of desserts, start there. Because people who are eating a chocolate chip cookie, a little mini bundt cake, a little cheesecake, they are so open to conversation. I never found anyone that interesting at the cut up vegetable table. So start there because you can always say, oh, is that good? Oh, do you think it has a lot of calories? People talk, oh, my mother had the best bundt cake recipe. And this goes to another tip. Bring who you are to what you do. People relate to the who you are. You're a baseball fan. I have a little bit of Chicago running through my Chicago River stream. We turn it green on St. Patrick's Day. Um, you know, I'm an author, but I'm also a speaker, but I also have some other things in my life. People know me because I have a sign on my door that says, Martha Stewart doesn't live here. Because I like to set expectations in the beginning. You want to smell baked bread? Go down to the bakery. Don't come to my house. You know, I don't want people to mistake me for someone that has great um, culinary skills. And did you see what I just did? I brought in a little bit about me. So if you're in a room with me, you know I'm from Chicago, you know I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know I'm an author, you know I don't like to cook. Um, you can start from there, and move on. You know, I might be a Giants fan, unless the Cubs are win winning, then I'm a Cubs fan because I'm a um, fair weather fan. And I'm wishing we have some more fair weather, but you know what I mean. Being a Chicago Cubs fan, that builds character. Okay. So in those reveals, you gave people lots of clues on what you could talk about and where to go. Mark LeBlanc teaches our authors uh, in, in one of our books, Defining You, that you need to have seven sentences you can give to people to quickly define you. It's not an elevator speech, but one of them is on a personal note. So it's one of the reasons I demo that, that I say, well, on a personal note, I'm a baseball nut and I'll reveal something about baseball. And on a personal note, you gave several things that you could reveal. And when we tested this, it was so much stronger. I kind of lost you. I lost your son. Ah, there you are. When we gave the personal note, we gave something that made us approachable. And so what you're saying is make yourself approachable. Um, yeah. Let's go more into your work. Um, what is driving you now? What what has Susan interested now? Well, I I I am an addicted Twitterer. I I love. I joined in July of two thousand and eight, and I'm going to tell you when we were down to one forty characters. Twitter made me a better, 
not just writer, but a better self editor. And I thought that was very interesting. It also made me a better reader because if I read and I do, I newspapers and magazines, et cetera, if I saw something that I thought would be of interest to this audience, I would share it. So it made me a better reader, um, a better writer, a better editor. And now that it's been around a while, I'm also a better replier. The other day I replied to Bette Midler, assured that she was waiting to hear from me. Um, but I do that now. If someone writes something, I have some pals that I know on Twitter that uh, there's one guy that I think is wildly funny and I sent a tweet about him, but we go back and forth. And I met one of my dearest friends because of Twitter. So I, I use social media. What, what's driving me now, you know, and this has been an amazing 19 months. And what I decided is I'm not letting Corona COVID virus interfere with my lifestyle. Now, did I travel? No, I had to cancel everything, but I love ballet. So I went to the New York City Ballet online to see my favorite uh, American, by the way, from San Diego, um, choreographer, Justin Peck. I go to ballets all over the world. I've gone to lectures. I figured that I have filled eight notebooks of notes from authors, teachers, historians, etc. I call this my self-directed um, PhD. In fact, I'm going to self-award myself a PhD. I just have to pick out the right dress for the event. But I decided this was my lifelong learning program the last few years. So I've done that. I also decided, hey, you wrote how to work a room. You talk about connecting. Well, why don't you get your friends together on Zoom? But this is a Patricia Fripp story. I've been on Zoom for eight years because I was always a podcast guest. And Patricia said to me, Rowan, you might want to buy the professional. I go, well, why would I am? She goes, you planned a brunch for your cousins. They won't want to get thrown off after 40 minutes. So I immediately put the professional. And because we were laughing going, yeah, with my family, we wouldn't even get to the introductions and, you know, catching up in 40 minutes. But then I decided my grammar school girlfriends should get together. And we still are every month. And then my high school pals, we get together every other month. And um, my sorority sisters, it wasn't my idea to get them together, but I've hosted them every month. So what I've really done through this is be me on purpose, but I've decided it's my job to stay in touch with people, not just setting up FaceTime and Zoom dates. I know that everyone's listening is going to find this shocking. I still pick up the phone and make a phone call. Tell me that isn't old school. Susan, let's talk more about this Zoom world and networking in the Zoom world, because this is not, as you said, these 19 months, it's just not going away. The world's changed and it's gonna continue. There'll be events, uh, I'm, we're all being invited to speak live, but we're also still being invited to speak on Zoom. What's your advice for networking in the Zoom world? First of all, it's what you just said, network in the Zoom world. Don't say I'm going, well, I'm going to wait and it's not comfortable. Enough with that. What's not comfortable? Having to do 200 push-ups. That's not comfortable. What, this is what it is. We are in this hybrid, oh my God. Oh my God. Now, now you all know what my um, cell phone ring is. Don't you wish your girlfriend were hot like me? Mm -hmm. Now, if that doesn't start a conversation, and I'm sorry, I didn't turn that off. Um, um, you know, I think the Zoom world is here to stay. And I just read today that WebEx is adding an, a hologram uh, AR aspect so that you'll be in the room, but it'll be like this hologram of you. And I thought, well, that's going to be really 
interesting. And now I also wrote to whoever wrote that in my reply that in 2018, I went to the Illinois Holocaust Museum and what they featured was a holographic exhibit of Holocaust survivors, some of whom had passed away since, and you could ask them questions in AR because it was a hologram of them. I thought, isn't that gonna be fascinating? Well, I have to wear a lot of makeup if it's a hologram of me in the meeting. I have no idea, but I think we're gonna go places a little faster than we had planned. And so I think Zoom is here to stay just like remote working is. Here's my line. Every time people say, well, I'm a remote worker and I always wonder, but are you remotely working? You know, that was just a little play on words. But you know that we've had the electronic cottage concept since I started working out of home at my home in 1980. People look down on us when we said we had a home office in 1980s, the early 80s. Then all of a sudden, people were going, oh, that looks like an option. And they talked about the electronic college, college, cottage, because you could have a computer there and do your work. So things have really radically changed, but I think no faster than in the last 19 months. So here's the thing, get over it. It's gonna be happening. Um, I, oh, here's the funny part. I had a couple friends that I usually go to New York every year and I wasn't going to see. And I said to one, I'm going to miss you this year. Can we have a FaceTime so I can see you? And two different people wrote, no, thanks. I'm good. <laughs> they didn't want to see me. They talked to me on the phone, but they didn't want to visit. So here's another point. If we're building relationships for our books, for as part of our marketing, if someone wants to talk on the phone, pick up the phone and you're the marketing guy, if someone says, you know, I prefer if we use Zoom or FaceTime, it can't be about us. If we're trying to market our book, we have to market it in the way the market wants to connect with us. I wanted to share some research that backs up everything you're saying. As Mark and I and Scott were working on the book Rainmaker Confidential, we interviewed over a hundred top rainmakers at large professional service firms. And we wanted to know, what are you doing more of? What are you doing less of? What's the go-to strategy now that all the rules are out? They were saying networking is still vitally important. You just have to do it differently. So you have to create the networking opportunities. One person I interviewed, who was a top person in the pharmaceutical industry, she just did a form of the research strategy and picked out people and said, I'd like to have a conversation with you. This is what I'm working on and this is what I'm doing. Would you be open to that? So many of these people she wanted to reach was a, were open to a Zoom call. And as you said, if they wanted to do it on the phone, do it on the phone. You were still making relationships. So. Do you have any other ideas on how we can reach out to people to create this Zoom networking opportunity? Well, first of all, I have to say, and this is in the um, spirit of who Susan Rowan is, Scott Love is a buddy of mine. And when I was in DC, the last time I traveled, we had dinner together. He's also an amazing artist and water, the watercolor guy. But he is also an expert at this idea of rainmaking, et cetera. But you know, when I wrote How to Work Room, I've been brought into a number of law firms and professional firms and even taught at Berkeley's UC Berkeley Law School because this idea is you've got to be the someone that brings in some business. And how do you do that? Well, you do go to events, but you have to also be the person that says, yes to Zoom, show up to something on Zoom. You see someone on a Zoom whose name sounds familiar, you go to the chat box and you indicate that you're interested in having a conversation. The other thing is we all have to be smart enough to know the chat box is there, check it. Um, 
I, I belong to the Golden Gate Breakfast Club. And one of the women was telling a story of taking her dog for a walk and tripping. And I'm telling you her whole eye, she had to be taken to the hospital. Well, I went to the chat box. Oh my goodness, are, you know, are you okay? So it changed the relationship that I just didn't sit on the Zoom, but that I sent her a special note. So you can do things through Zoom. And then how about this? You meet someone and sometimes in some events you'll be in a breakout room. And if you like someone or they say something interesting, what you do is you say, that is so interesting. Would love to talk to you about it further. Do, do, would you, I don't do a lot of messaging through LinkedIn, but it's, here's your email, here's your LinkedIn, here's your whatever your messenger thing is. You can invite people. Richard Branson quoted me because of what I wrote as a remedy for a roadblock. Instead of good things come to those who wait, the Rowan version that he quoted me on is good things come to those who initiate. When we are authors, when we want to build our book, if you wait for people, we end up getting, oh, I know, white hair. That's what happened after I waited a corona year. Initiate. Good things come to those who initiate. Pick up the phone, invite someone, send an email, find them on LinkedIn, send them a message. If if we don't initiate for those things that we like and those people with whom we have some interest, then we don't control our own lives. And so I wanna give everyone permission that if you see someone or hear someone that sounds interesting to you, let them know. A lot of us are walking around, we're like wounded. We can't see our families or now we're seeing them, but I won't get on a plane. So Auntie Bubby isn't going out to say, uh, to Vegas to you know take the boys to sushi. I'm good for a lot of rolls of sushi for these kids. Um, so initiate. Can we have, can we set up a, a FaceTime? Can we set up a Zoom? Can we do something? Let people know you're interested. And if this isn't just about business. This also is in your personal life. And even with your families, everyone's sitting around waiting for the other person to start. Don't wait. Listen to Richard Branson, who, oh, by the way, on his list, I was number six and number five was Diana Ross. So I ran around telling everyone, I'm the backup singer for Diana Ross. Stop in the name of promoting your book. You know, I just, and you can see that I don't take myself so seriously, though I take what I do very seriously. And you'll notice something else about humor, and I learned it from my grandfather. I kind of smile when I think I'm saying something fun or funny. Because my grandfather was funny, but he didn't think his grandchildren were smart enough to know he was funny, so he'd cue us. So when you say something that you think is amusing or interesting, cue people. Let your face tell them what you think about what you're saying. I have found that in the online world, I when I make a joke, I have to put a little smiling face next to it. Otherwise, I get very serious people explaining to me why uh, what I said was actually wrong. And uh, so there. I know that's um, that's the online world. The other thing is, uh, someone even asked me recently, and I would suggest this to our authors: a clubhouse is an interesting forum. Um, and there's a part of me, okay, this is the Chicago part, feet on the ground, common sense, Midwest. And people are going, this is a phenomenal thing. It's audio only and blah, blah, blah. And it's interactive. I'm going, uh, that's what telephones were. This is not a new thing. So the idea of you think this is so fabulous, pick up the phone and call your mother, your grandmother, or your grandfather. Um, but I think Clubhouse is an interesting forum. Someone asked me what I thought of it. I've run a couple of rooms and I drop into rooms and I'm thinking, I listen to people go on and on and on. And I'm thinking, oh, no wonder there are a lot of coaches on there. There are so many people that need help. I mean, therapy. I, you know, I'm listening to all this angst. But I think it's a forum we should be aware of as authors. And I also listen to all these people 
I can tell you how to sell a million books. Look, I've sold a million books and I don't know how to tell you. So I would be very circumspect and go with people like Mark and Henry, whom you trust, who you know have the data and the information and the experience. Um, these shiny bright objects and all these people talking about things that they've never done always gives me agita. So your, your point about make a phone call reminds me, uh, the year was 2019, the place San Diego, Jim Haran is delivering a keynote for me to a room of a hundred independent consultants. And he's a boomer. Uh, he's, the late Jim Rand was, you know, was a boomer. And he, his message, his, what we call in keynote, the month after message he wants you to retain is pick up the damn phone. So he's repeating this, pick up the damn phone and just dial it. And I'm sitting next to a millennial woman. And I leaned over and I said, phones used to have dials. You had to dial things. And she said, oh no, that's okay. I've seen the old movies. And I said, oh, well, if there's anything else you need me to uh, mansplain to you, like travel agents or mimeograph machines, just ask. And she said, oh, don't worry. I just Google that stuff. Well, you know, there's a funny line for that. Um, they interviewed Michael Chabon and his wife, Ayelet Waldman, who are two authors, very novelists. And they both write, they both work for a moment. They have four kids and oh, someone was interviewing them for San Francisco paper. Well, how do you manage this with four kids? And, and Ayelet Waldman said, we never argue about anything. And then she paused and said that we can't look up on Google. <laughs> Susan, I want to thank you so much. I just also want to take a moment to tell everybody who is considering doing a podcast that when I was at the University of California, San Diego and helping to run their TV station, and we'd work with people like Atlantic Magazine to do shows, the most popular shows, the format is the one you're looking at right now, a side-by-side -side conversation. And it would be great if we were in the room next to each other and had two high back chairs and looking at each other, but it works in Zoom just fine. Beautifully. So thank you so much for being generous with your time and your talent. We're looking forward to actually hearing you live in March. That's gonna be so great. And to everyone, thanks for being with us. And we look forward to you joining us on a future podcast for marketing with a book. Have a great week, everybody.